I think we reached the full room. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning in the States. And uh, thank you so much for joining this panel discussion, which is dedicated to the state of civic education in Europe and to the challenges faced by civic educators in our societies. My name is Daniel Hegedusch. I lead the Central Europe program of the German Marshall Fund, and I am warmly welcoming our today's speakers, uh, Luisa Slavkova and Maya Kurilic. Luisa Slavkova is co-founder and partner of the Civics Innovation Hub, the co-organizer of our today event, and also founder of SOFIA Platform, one of Bulgaria's key CSOs, which is active at the field of civic education. Luisa is a well-known political scientist, a prolific writer, author and editor of several books, and also a well-known mover and shaker to the Bulgarian civil society. Maya Kurilic is hub manager of the Croatian hub of the civics innovation in Zagreb. Maya is a CEU public policy alumna, an Albach alumna, a former public sector consultant, and a side of the civic innovation hub, actually also a project coordinator at the Croatian Education Foundation, Znanja Nadjel. Thank you both for accept me, accepting our invitation. And uh, for more than a decade now, we are experiencing what we could uh, call the third way of autocratization on the whole globe. The former advancement of democracy in the 90s and the early 2000s was followed by a hollowing and fading of democratic pro processes in the luckier Western societies. And by sheer democratic backsliding and autocratization in the less lucky ones. Central Europe plays a pivotal role in this process, being both the fastest autocratizing part of the globe and also practically the birthplace of the first successful authoritarian breakthrough against established Western liberal democracies. And if we take a closer look on the causes as it's fair to say that the weak institutionalization of democratic education in the official school curricula after the democratic transition of 1989-1990 and uh, the limited funding available for informal civic education are one of the main reasons behind the recent democratic malaise. This panel aims to discuss the main lessons learned from the comparative study conducted by the Civics Innovation Hub in 21 European countries regarding the state of civic education. And we also try to identify potential entry points, how we could strengthen democratic resilience through civic education in Europe. Regarding the housekeeping rules, Maya and Luisa will present the main findings of their research and approximately after 45 minutes, we will go into a, an open Q&A and, uh, and discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please use the Q&A and the chat functions of Zoom to submit your questions or comments to the panelists. And I also would like to remind you that the event is recorded and will be available online at the YouTube channel of the Outlip project. This strange abbreviation Outlip stands for Neo-Authoritarianism in Europe and the Liberal Democratic Response. Uh, this Horizon project, where GMF also participates, investigates the sources of implications of divergence from the model of liberal democracy in Europe. And the project's main aim is to provide a toolkit for policymakers to defend and enhance liberal democracy against its challengers by understanding and also explaining the nature of illiberal ideologies, processes, and policies. And on the part of the Outlip Consortium, we are delighted that we could team up this time with the Civics Innovation Hub for this panel discussion. So thank you for joining us. And Maya, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the kind um, words. Uh, let me start by uh, sharing the screen and the presentation for today. Um, so first, um, we will start by me telling you more about the project. Uh, project mapping civic education in Europe, what it is, when it took place, what was our methodology, just so you have some initial understanding. Then Luisa will take over with the comparative findings and key recommendations that we have developed from our work. So mapping civic education is a flagship project uh, of the civics. It's a, a dynamic initiative that is continuously evolving by adding new countries to the first ever 
pan-European virtual map of civic educators. Um, this project is supported by the German Federal Agency for Civic Education. Uh, we have started this project in the beginning of 2021, and we are continuing uh, throughout 2024. Uh, before we go into more details, let's just discuss who can be mapped as a part of our work. So we have a focus not only on organizations, but we are also mapping individuals who are actively implementing activities in the field of civic education. And we will talk in more depth on the definition of civic education, but for now we have kept a quite uh, broad definition of civic education, including um, non-formal and informal civic education. So not the civic education that's happening in schools, but that that's happening outside of schools. Uh, our focus uh, was set on NGOs, on different networks, foundations, but as I said, also on individuals, meaning experts in the profession. And we have been able to reach also social media influencers on the topic because we also find them important civic uh, educators of today's world. Um, just for some structure, uh, we have had, we have two cycles of the mapping. The first um, has started in 2021 and we have finalized in spring this year. And this is going to be the basis from which we are pulling uh, the findings that we will talk a bit uh, later on. This has included 21 countries that are now shown on the map and where the survey has been conducted. But also as a 22nd country, we have had included Turkey with an expert opinion piece. And now since uh, last week, um, we have started a second cycle of the mapping in 10 more countries, which you can see uh, on the screen. And in those countries, we are at the initial step of uh, commissioning the survey. I will later on put all the important links uh, for you in, in the chat. Um, of course, we have been selecting uh, these uh, countries or based on where uh, based on where we have uh, local partners. We have had different tenders for partners, and there has been a certain flexibility to this. For example, we did have a partnership secured in Ukraine for the first cycle, but our partner has stopped all the activities uh, once the war broke out. So we had to make um, some amendments to the to the list of of countries. So let's take a look into the methodology. Um, just keeping in mind, this is a mapping project done by an NGO. So of course, if you will have more uh, in-depth questions on the methodology, I'll be happy to answer, but this is just a glimpse that I will now provide you with. Um, as I have mentioned, uh, we are basically we are doing a survey, actually two sets of surveys. And for this, uh, we have local partners in each of the countries. Um, we have had um, multiple calls with different um, organizations and individuals in countries. We have then selected them, and then they provide us with an initial database of civic education actors uh, in their country. We do support them throughout this uh, journey of theirs. Um, this To this database, then the survey is sent out. Um, survey is covering different questions on the organization, basic um, information on the organization, what are their needs. And uh, then they also have um, one section when they can name other relevant organizations. So this is so-called snowballing method. And as a step three, because we wanted to ensure that we still have control over the process, we as a team are uh, validating these extra um, extra contacts that we have received. Um, those then again receive the invitation to the questionnaire, of course. Um, only those who answer to the first questionnaire get the invite to the second questionnaire, which is uh, crucial for confirming relations between, between actors. Once we have all these results, um, we have analyzed them, but also part of the results uh, we have used for programming and designing our virtual map uh, that I will be showing you a bit later. I have uh, told you a little bit about the key survey areas. Here they are all together. So we ask civic educators on the type of civic education they work on, what are the civic education topics they focus on, whom they are working with, 
We ask them about their financial health and funding sources. Uh, we ask also about training and capacity building needs. Um, and we also take a look into um, how do they collaborate. We talk, we ask them about networking and peer learning. Um, also, what uh, we have asked our local partners to do, so we don't only have this raw data from the survey, but we also ask local partners to write expert opinion pieces, which give us further understanding of civic education in a country. So basically, expert opinion pieces are two page documents that are depicting a main uh, features of civic education in country. Uh, and for cycle one, we have 22 expert opinion pieces, um, and we have had a partnership with LSC Ideas Ratio Forum blog, and they have featured a collection of reports on Central Eastern and Southeast Europe. And this here on the left, you can see the preview, how it looks on the on their web page uh, when they have um, published a country expert report on, on Slovakia. Um, going forward, a brief look into the results uh, of the first cycle of the mapping. So we have uh, been able to uh, combine, compile a database of almost 3,000 civic educators in 21 countries. To this database, we have sent out the survey and we have gotten more than 430 responses um, with an average response rate 15.6%. Um, and anybody who has ever done online surveying uh, has is knows that this is not an easy task with all the reminders and asking people uh, multiple times to join. Not We all know how, how it is when we get the survey into our mail, mailbox. So this is the response rate that uh, we are quite content with in the time of uh, general fatigue with, with online, online surveying. Um, and here is uh, now we're going to go into the map of civic education. Um, here I have put a QR code, you can scan it, but I will later on put a link also in the in the chat. Um, let's now take a look into, into the map. So map, first of all, shows you the geographic map of Europe, where you can see uh, currently mapped um, entities and where they are. In the orange box, then there is a drop down menu and you can select a certain country. And now in this example, we zoom in into Albania and you see where the actors are in the in the country. Then there is a second view option, and that is the show the network option. Once we go into showing the network, um, then a new window opens up where you have ability to see all the actors that we have mapped in a certain country. And here you're viewing them by a city where they are. Hovering over, you see their uh, names. And clicking on them, you see the full name. You see whom they are connected with in the country. And on the right-hand side, you see a little profile of theirs um, with the contact information of theirs. So. The map can be sorted, as I said, by location, by legal status, and by a founding, a founding year. So here, legal status, we see private, nonprofit. Um, there were no public entities, seems. Then founding year, the map rearranges the dots, uh, the dots on it. Map can also be filtered by to help you um, searching for different entities by main field of work, focus of civic education and type of entity. There is a list of different main fields of work. For example, you're looking for somebody working in environment and sustainability or culture and arts, and then the map uh, rearranges itself and helps you um, in searching for, for um, different entities. It's important to know that the map, uh, the aim of the map is to facilitate further collaboration in the sector. It is here to help you, for example, if you were a civic educator from Croatia, where I am ba based, and you want to find a partner in Finland looking in, working in environment, this would be then the tool that you would be using. But what we have also um, hoped for, and this seems to have become reality, those who are supporting civic education in Europe, different 
um, different supporters, they said that they are also using the map just to see who is out there and who is working on which and how they can maybe um, combine it with their programs and with, with their offer. And also you have on the map, there is a view of um, all countries uh, together, of all countries um, at glance. Uh, you can also rearrange the map as view, as list. You can search for an organization to see if somebody whom you know is on the map, um, and maybe if they're not, you send them the link. Um, also in this part, you can highlight the map uh, by legal status, main field of work, and civic education focus. For example, here you have a set of criteria, and if you click on healthcare, you can see that not majority of the civic educators we have been able to map work in the field of um, health health literacy. But if you then add culture and arts, then the then the, the visualization um, rearranges again. Hovering over, you see their names and. We, we deem this as a quite quite helpful tool and we hope it's it's user friendly. Um, apart from the map that I have now uh, shown you, um, all that we have um, gathered, uh, all the all the knowledge we have gathered from the survey has been published in the publication that is available since the beginning of the year, uh, co-authored by Louisa and me. And I would now give the word to Luisa to uh, walk you through patterns and trends in civic education, uh, all of this based on the first cycle of the mapping that we have worked on. Just give me one second um, to figure out the sharing and I will um, continue from where Maya stopped, hopefully. So. There it is. Somehow on my end, whenever I try the full screen sharing, um, it doesn't allow me. So I'm going to try one more time. I think now it's working, is it? Isn't it? It is great. So um, all the data that I'm going to be talking about, I think it's much less exciting than um, than how the map looks like because the map the lab is a little bit the map is a little bit like a video game. So you can click and filter and do stuff and discover cool things about organizations you might know about or in best case not know about. And all of this here is, I think, data that is just for um, for geeks like uh, like you and us. As Maya already mentioned, this is here aggregated data from these 434 um, surveys that we received um, filled out by uh, civic educators of all um, uh, different sorts from all these 21, 21 countries. And so to begin with, what is the definition of civic education that we use? As Maya said, we kept it um, quite open in terms of what topics we consider to be topics of civic education. Could be someone who's working on the verge of health education and civics, especially during the times of the pandemic, but it could be also someone who's working on financial literacy in civic education, someone who does classical work of community building, um, social inclusion, civil rights. So, you know, it's a big basket of topics we did not want to exclude. But in the way we described the the civic educator profile is that we always made sure um, to, to explain to educators that we're looking for those who actually work on the so-called civic competences. And this is a definition we use from the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe, those of you who are not familiar with it, I put down there the Council of Europe's butterfly. It is this beautiful um, visual that says civic competences are a combination of civic knowledge, civic skills, civic attitudes, and civic values. So we stepped on that definition, kept the topical scope pretty open, and said, if you think you do one of these things for us, you're a civic educator, maybe you call yourself something, something else. But if you fit into this description, please fill out this questionnaire. Um, there is no uh, reward at the end, but this report. 
So um, on the, what we discovered from collecting the, now this is where I'm getting to the comparative part. What we discovered is that in each of those 21 countries, there is basically no cohesive naming conventions. Some people call, in some countries call civic education, civic education, others call it uh, um, uh, education populaire in France, um, yet others call, call it democratic education, others call it citizenship education. Some do not call it any of that because it's just too divisive for their respective country. And I immediately think here of Croatia and Spain, for example. So um, the fact that there is no cohesive naming convention makes any research attempt very difficult. Hence, we took this descriptive approach saying, if you're somewhere here in the description, go ahead and fill it, fill it out. This is the challenge we're going to talk about in the recommendations, recommendations bit. We also discovered that um, obviously the challenges that are challenges for civic education are the same challenges that um, we face in terms of uh, uh, challenges to democracy. It is for us really important to highlight this, even though it sounds like a no-brainer, only because um, it is in the civic educators oftentimes feel a little bit like the nurses and the doctors during the pandemic. They are, whenever there is a crisis, and currently we have a poly crisis, they are called to the forefront. At the same time, they're not really well equipped, a little bit like the nurses and the doctors were not in the beginning of the pandemic. However, we're living in a time of crisis for democracy for more than, uh, you know, the two years we're in a pandemic. So the question still remains, why aren't civic educators as well equipped as they actually should be to be fighting on this better of fronts? And so the majority of educators would, would agree that the challenges that they face, you know, in terms of world events or local events um, are some of the one, some of some of those that we have listed listed over here, which means there are both homegrown challenges, but also such that are global. And when we speak of global, we obviously think of um, a climate change, for example. Um, and when we talk about local, this is really like the, the the range of challenges they face can be um, from a so-called super diversity, like in Belgium, for example, um, uh, or, you know, being uh, next door to Ukraine and um, having to deal with the threat of war, but also uh, a migration, migration wave. Um, then when it comes to um, uh, the foremost civic education sector, even though we did not look, look into it in the survey, but we did ask our partners to, um, to share their thoughts on the state of formal civic education, it doesn't look good. That's I think the that's I think the shortcut explanation. Why not? So you would have in half of those 21 countries a formalized approach to civics. This means that's a separate subject that is that is taught either in the um, in 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 the um, upper uh, level of education or throughout. But the subject is never taken seriously because it's not um, uh, you know the grading is not important or it's not graded at all. Um, or teachers just think it's, you know, it's not the classics, it's not a mint, it's not an employability uh, skill that it's, that it's looking into. And so they do not take it seriously and kids also do not take it seriously. The other half of the countries we surveyed have the so-called cross-curricular approach, which means there are competences of civics that are embedded in the curriculum. And basically every teacher is supposed to teach a little bit of, of all of that. And when everyone, every teacher is supposed to teach a little bit of that, no one is really teaching it. And there is no way to actually grade this cross-curricular so-called competence approach. We have also a, a good example, of, a good practice example here amongst the countries, that's Italy. Um, but apart from that, this cross-curricular approach is difficult also because teachers are not trained to think in that way. As a, um, a teacher in chemistry, you're not um, taught to think um, uh, that you can actually combine chemistry uh, with civic education, for example, in, in, in some, some way. There is definitely a big gap between, between what's written in the uh, curricula and in terms of standards and what the reality of te teaching um, uh, is like. And then lastly, there is an interesting, because we're still in the formal sector, there's an interesting emerging um, field of um, civic education as civics courses in university which is um, not studied um, studied at all. We spot it here and there. Some countries have that. This is very often the universities that are part of the 
um, Osun network. This is the Open Society Universities network, but this still requires um, obviously more more um, uh, research. Now I'm coming to the to the data. This is, and I'm not going to be able to show you all the data today, obviously, because we don't have um, have the time. But Maya, myself, and uh, Daniel, now I think I can count you to the fan club. We can encourage you to read the report, whatever you're bored um, at night. So this is just um, showing very quickly that the majority of those we were able to survey um, obviously identify themselves as nonprofit. I think this doesn't come as a surprise. What is a little bit more interesting is on another graph, which I won't be able to show you now, um, to see how organizations beyond the legal status actually identify themselves, whether they think they're a think tank, an association, um, or something else. And I think this is also interesting, especially when you start using the map, because this is where you get to use the filter if you are, I don't know, a Czech think tank that looks for a think tank in Finland and in France, you can actually uh, go through that and figure out who is a good partner for you. Um, but at the end of the day, most of them are non-governmental organizations. Then um, when it comes to the geographical reach, I think this one is not going to be a surprise for anyone that the majority of organizations have either a national or a local impact and reach. This means they work um, on a national level, especially in the smaller countries or mid-sized European countries, local, also very much predominantly focusing on local issues in their local communities, and then only comes um, a region and international. For us as an organization that is interested in the infrastructure and ecosystem around civic education in Europe, the fact that international civic um, uh, education work is um, at roughly 30% tells us that there is a lot of potential to uh, to work in that, um, in that direction in order to boost that. Um, when it comes to the main topics educators focus on, this is um, not a big surprise uh, either, or rather is. I would be curious to hear what you think, because oftentimes um, I think people like, like you and us who deal with topics related to democracy all the time, we think educators work on climate change, media literacy, debunking conspiracy theories, um, and all of that. And at the end of the day, it turns out that non-formal civic educators still do a very classical job of actually working in the field of civic engagement and participation, social inclusion, community building. So these are usually the topics that are very close to the people that are very tangible. Um, and apparently the majority of educators are engaged there. We've put here um, the last two, just as an example for you to see how much space there is between working with media or on media literacy and history and remembers and civic engagement and participation or community building. So that you, can, you just really see Sometimes our perception is that's probably what educators do, but at the end of the day, this is what data data um, data shows us. I just put this here in as an example, and because we are also in the framework of Central and Eastern Europe, just to see the three countries we we mapped from, you know, the Visegrad for um, again, what is the topical what is the topical focus of their of their works? I have encircled here also civil rights because apparently. This is a important topic, at least um, in uh, uh, you know in Poland and in um, in a country like Romania. And I think this does um, you know these country differences usually show you where the countries actually see probably a little bit more need to work on specific specific topics. I also encircled in Slovakia media, for example, because it's twenty one percent. So uh, compared to to all the others, it's still a little bit more prominent than um, than in the rest of the rest of the countries. I'm going over to um, uh, whether the war in Ukraine had an, had an impact on their work. We asked this question only after the first um, cycle of the mapping. So do not wonder why the countries here are not the full list of 21. So for example, we don't have Poland, which would have definitely been very affected by the war because what this graph shows us um, and also the opinion pieces we got is that Geographical proximity means you're affected by the war and your work is affected by the war. Um, and being far away from Ukraine basically means um, it doesn't have such an impact, uh, such an impact on you. And as Maya said in the beginning, we were not able to map some countries just because the war made it impossible, like um, like Moldova, for example. 
this is, I think, um, just, you know, to stay a little bit longer with the Ukraine example, um, it just, just again highlights to us how how big the importance of local topics for civic education is. So even though we're trying, you know, to look for comparatives and all that, local topics are always what matters the most to um, to civic educators. When it comes to the main target groups, um, on a comparative level, um, we were also not very surprised to see that the majority um, of organizations work with young people. I think this is um, generally the trend in education, in non-formal education, but also in civic non-formal education, you work with the young people because this is when um, competences are formed uh, the easiest, young people are um, organized um, if you get them in a um, setting that is close to school or you work with teachers or with libraries and all these non-formal educational um, setups. However, we also found outliers um, in the group 65 plus here, for example, the Benelux countries or Finland. And this is an interesting trend for us and it, and we think is a trend worth following in the next years because with changing demographic pyramids and with um, uh, uh, ch changing um, uh, demographic structures, we will be seeing um, more uh, citizens 65 plus making decisions for uh, uh, younger, for the younger generations. And it's worthwhile considering them as a target group of civic education, because otherwise I think um, uh, we are missing on to working with a significant part of our of our societies. Then over here, we've put just again the break the breakdown of the previous um, of the previous graph, just to see um, how Central Eastern European countries um, are doing in their group. I've highlighted, apart from you know the younger generations, also the focus on professional groups, especially for Poland. Um, professional groups in this case means mainly teachers, and it's very important to see. Um, how, for example, colleagues in Poland, by virtue of not being able to work closely with schools on the national level, are actually on the local level, on the level of regions, trying to do civic education work via the teachers, because this is um, how they can go around um, the difficulty of actually going to schools. Um, I'm moving on to the next one, um, which is was a question related to the methods educators are using. And here again, just like with the topics, we would see that the methods that are used are very traditional one, I would say, um, uh, with workshops and trainings, awareness raising campaigns, probably less so, because this is a tool um, that I think has been um, up and coming and related very much to advocacy for certain topics. Um, and so educators are, are into that as well. Capacity building is mentioned here, you know, doing publications, using using different um, weapon digital tools, organizing study trips, et cetera. At the end, we have put some relatively, um, you know, new, new tools where we're also aware that they're not mass tools, but still we wanted to see, um, see whether educators use them they use them obviously much less than those rather um, traditional tools. And remember this um, this um, graph, because at some point we will come to, um, to capacity building needs of civic educators. And this is where they would um, they would share um, something that very nicely connects with this with this graph. Moving on to the next one, um, this is like I think um, you know, for for you, I think this is not going to come as a surprise because um, there is a constant conversation about how underfunded, in and of itself, democracy work um, and civil society work is in in Europe, especially Central, Eastern, Southeastern, and Eastern Europe. But I think this was once again for us a really good way to match the low budgets with the big claims I began with um uh at the at the at the the, the, the um in the beginning of the presentation. So the average of um the 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 aggregated data told us that 42.4% of the respondents in so of these 434 uh, respondents operate on a budget that is smaller than um 100,000 euros. We have a bunch of other questions that ask um, ask them about their financial uh, health. 
And it turns out that they very much apply this unwritten rule of 30% goes for core costs and 70% goes for activity costs, as we all know from all the project applications all of us have, have written. And so if we take this rule into account, the 30-70%, and if we imagine that they work on a budget that is smaller than 100,000 per year, this means that they have something like 30,000 euros per year for their teams. And this is where you can do your own math, how much of a sustainable team and how much of a good team you can actually pay over the course of an entire year with 30,000 euros. As I said, in the publication, which is also at uh, my background and Maya's background, you can go and have a little bit of a look into the additional data on funding, which looks into a size of team, size and number of volunteers, number of external experts, um, core team, um, external, uh, you know, vo vo volunteers and all of that. So it's really, I think it's it's worthwhile digging into that if you really care more to um, to learn about the financial health of organizations. I'm uh, moving on to um, the funding sources. I think this is also interesting to look into just because also countries here differ a lot. I've highlighted again, um, for example, Poland, where you definitely see that national public funding is much lower compared to many of the other countries um, as opposed to uh, European funding. I think we all know the reasons uh, for that, but it's just, again, also good to see how the data is, um, is highlighting the fact that many organizations in civic education cannot and do not want to rely uh, and actually, uh, you know, are not do not have access to um, to, uh, to states funding. Moving on to the next one, um, which asks about uh, needs for further training and capacity building. Number one is new. So new everything, approaches, tools, methods. I I think civic educators are really on the look for. Okay, what are those things that help us do the best job we can? What are maybe some new exciting approaches someone has tried out? There's definitely a big need to learn um, whatever is new out there has been tested and has really proven to be impactful. Impact evaluation and evaluative learning. Um, I, Maya and I, we were very, you know, very excited to see that it has such a such a high value for um, for educators. Simply because I also understand that, you know, in also in in conversations with with different colleagues, that um, this is not necessarily because um, funders want you to do impact evaluation, but it's really because you want to make sure that what you do has an added value, um, and that you can also learn um, how to do this better as you go. Um, securing funding, this is not a surprise. We were surprised that it was not not number number one. Um, innovation, foresight thinking, you know, a big buzzword these days in civic education circles, um, communication, this goes hand in hand also in learning how to do um, public awareness campaigns. Um, next slide is taking us to the question, um, if one could choose whether if one would like to have more peer-to-peer learning opportunities at home or internationally. Here, there was a, a little bit of a surprise for Maya and myself. We thought the majority is actually going to want to have international exchange. It proved exactly the opposite. The majority of educators actually would like to have national exchange with others who work on civic education. And there is so much that speaks in favor of building and maintaining national networks. Um, but unfortunately, out of the 21 countries we mapped, we can only name two good practice examples of national uh, civic education networks that emerge from civil society. One of them is in Austria and the other one is in Slovakia. Um, next slide um, takes us to uh, a question which we asked, um, because as I said, as a pan-European organization, we're also interested in what would actually organizations profit the most from if there were a pan-European network devoted to civics? And then um, international projects is on top of uh, top of the list. Exchange of good practices, and again, exchange on the latest uh, trends and tools and topics. I think there is a desire to really talk to others, like peer-to-peer, you know, -peer, just tell me how exactly you do that, what exactly you do. You know, this is like really getting into the nitty gritty details of, uh, 
okay, if I have a session of 45 minutes, how do I do it so that I make sure it sticks? I think this is exactly the conversation educators are, are looking for. Opportunities for joint projects na na nationally um, is also there and you would see it's around the 50%. Um, so that has a very big value for, for educators as well as peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, learning formats. I am coming to the key recommendations, which is the really last part of um, part of my expose for for tonight. Um, uh, Daniel, if I am uh, over overstepping my, you just give me a timeout and I'll stop. So we've put them in five sections, just the way the um, the the report is also uh, um, structured. The first basket of the recommendations. Taram money. So um, money for a variety of reasons. And I think this is what we're trying to unpack in this section. On the one hand, money for non-formal civic educators, because it seems that teachers depend um, in their majority on non-formal civic educators for um, materials, for uh, teacher trainings for alternative offers that they could give to young people in terms of what they can do outside of the classroom, but also for reality um, uh, a check and connection to real life. So if there is not enough funding for non-formal civic education, this means teachers are also pretty much left to whatever their national ministries or local regional uh, you know, um, um, uh, institutions of the ministry decide to decide to do. Um, now, money is not necessarily always just about, it's not all, only always just about the money, but it's about how the money is being given to, to, to civic educators. I think for a while now, we're talking about the importance of shifting from project based to sustainable funding mechanisms. So those who actually enable organizations to grow, to consolidate, but also to keep doing what they're really good at instead of you know jumping from one idea to the next, which as we all know we very often need to do. Um because you know for for all the bad reasons unfortunately somehow this relationship between um, funding partners and receiving partners has become, you know, a little bit transactional, right? So um, I promise to do that in six to 12 months, and I'm going to give you the money for this. And next time you definitely need to come up with a certain, with a different idea. So I think this is really important to understand why this growth and consolidation is very important. Also keeping in mind those 42% of organizations operating on a budget less than 100,000 per year then it's also very important to create this enabling environment for organizations nationally, but also in a pan-European level, in order for those new ideas, need for peer exchange and all of that to actually find, have a have a space where it can happen and it can it can um it can flow. I know um networking is like uh no one really wants to invest in networking, but this is what people are asking for. And so I think there is very little argument that one can use against against that. Then I think it's also important to have a little bit of um, funds just to play around, just to test out um, ideas, to see which methods works, which not. Because unlike um, uh, the mint subject, you know, uh, mathematics and all of that, we can't enter with civic education in the lab do an experiment, have either an explosion or a flat, and then know what follows. So here it's, you know, a lot of things we know, but there are also many things that we just need to try out. So educators need also a little bit of money to test out things and maybe even fail if, if need be. And finally, and this goes hand in hand with this need to learn how to also use maybe foresight, it's important to help educators think um, beyond the current crises. So in a way to help both young people, but also other target groups that they may have to think, think preemptively. So if educators cannot um, think preemptively themselves, they can also not pass this knowledge on to whoever they are, um, they are targeting with their, their activities. Our second basket of recommendations um, goes um, along the lines of capacity building needs. So um, 
I did mention this already in the funding basket, but here again, this need for really thinking about an ecosystem where um, exchange, capacity building, experimentation uh, can be enabled. Um, capacity building needs oftentimes need to be tailored um, to the specific country. And this is where you can look at the national data that is in the report, because different countries really do have different needs. So if you're living in a country, as Daniel said in the beginning, that is um, under an authoritarian threat or a, uh, uh, um, or an, or a semi-authoritarian government, you might need to have support in survival tactics and um, awareness raising campaigns. While if you were working, um, I don't know, in um, let's say rural Romania, you might actually need to have support in how to do more um, community building and community based uh, based work. So really looking into the local needs, I think this is very very important. But this this is also important for larger um, uh, European. Uh, grant making organizations and schemes that you know take everyone under the same denominator and um kind of um assume that the needs are are the same same everywhere peer to peer learning opportunities i think the graph spoke um spoke for itself our uh, third basket is the need for um more research uh and uh um uh, uh measuring informal and non-formal civic education I will just tell you that the last report that we have that compared school civic education is from five years ago. So we don't have data and information to work with, but we also don't have data and information to know what's a baseline and how we move beyond that baseline, not to mention non-formal. So non-formal, because of the difference in the naming conventions and all of that, it's very difficult to to do it uh, in the beginning, my I think uh, uh, and her little team can uh, can share a lot of the pains of of trying to 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 do all that. But this is the first attempt ever um, in Europe to map non formal and informal civic education. So um, we need more of that. We need more data. We need more um, uh, collection mechanisms. We, we need more common indicators so that we can actually do a really good job in um, in comparing what is going on um, in the different different countries. Um, and the second to last uh, um, basket is looking into the um, into the formal sector. It obviously uh, starts um, from having really good university teaching programs. So teachers are taught elsewhere at the university. The question is how exactly do these programs look like? We don't know. We haven't really had the capacity to study this in the in the report. Um, the question of improving the lack of, you know, this perceived lack of seriousness of the subject. So why, what's the reason for that? How can we convince teachers that this is a really, really, really very important job? Is as as important as learning how to read and learning how to do how to do your uh, your uh, math. Um, then, if we are still using this cross curricular curricular approach and the competences approach, we need to help teachers work um, across subjects. Otherwise, they'll never be able to do this um, this competence based approach. Um, focus on how young people especially can practice civic education that is taught in school rather than really learning only about, okay, this is the parliament and this is the court and this is the president, you know, institutions, what the institutions do. Um, teacher training programs, um, they should be able to combine both all those new topics relevant to democracy in general, whether it's climate change, whether it's you know the war in Ukraine, uh, um, and, and 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 all of that, but also the classical ones, because I think one of the things we are seeing from um, a different study that is luckily done every five years for many years now, it's called ICCS, and it compares the civic competence of the thirteen-year-old ones across the world. It showed uh, it show it shows us in the latest edition from twenty twenty two that the rise of um, additional um, civic topics in school like climate change and sustainability takes away time from the classical civic education topics and leaves a real gap. So this means if teachers do not know how important it is to put an emphasis on both the classical and the new topics, the classical topics start to suffer. Um, this is, I think, the main the main takeaway. Um, 
And then obviously the last one, uh, we're, I think we're, we're biased here, but we always say we need to, we need to make sure we, um, non-formal and informal works together with the formal sector in an ideal world, because in countries like Hungary and Poland these days, as I said, that's, uh, unfortunately impossible. My last point is, um, uh, a quest, uh, for all of us and for people who might be smarter than, than Maya and, and, and myself. Let's try to wrap our heads around coming up with a common language. And I know this is different languages and different traditions in each of the countries. And as I said, everyone has a different understanding of what civics exactly is and should do, because at the end of the day, in its core is the question, what makes you into a good citizen? And the answer can vary depending on whom you ask. And still, I think this is a point of departure, or this is the first step we need to take in order to then develop common indicators and start developing this this common system of having a shared language and having a shared understanding and providing um, a tailored support for civic educators if we really want them to continue being the ones on the forefront of this uh, battle against autocratization. I will stop here. Um, and we have a Q&A slide, but I think I can stop sharing that so I can also see you again. Thank you so much, Luisa, and thank you so much, Maya, for this for this excellent presentation, for introducing uh, the map for us, which I think will be widely used by civil society organizations as a networking tool in the future, and also sharing your, your uh, findings and recommendations with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the Q&A is open, so please feel free to submit your questions either via the Q&A function or the chat function. And meanwhile, you are considering your questions. I also would like to have an intervention and, and two questions to our speakers. The intervention is that Luisa mentioned that funding available to support networking uh, is rare in the region. And I just would like to call your attention that in the Engaging Central Europe program of GMF, we recently have an open call for proposal with the submission deadline of the 15th of November uh, to support youth participation projects, which obviously also uh, include civic education, and we would be delighted to receive uh, the highest possible number of applications from all eight Central and Eastern European countries. And uh, from uh, presumably from 15th of October, we will have also another call for proposal uh, dedicated to Bulgarian, Polish, and Hungarian CSOs, which will have also specifically a domestic networking component. So uh, I will just share the URL soon in uh, in the chat. Please feel free to visit our website, uh, take a look on, uh, on the funding opportunities, because we are aware that indeed supporting even domestic networking of civic education NGOs could be and should be uh, a crucial contribution to strengthening this sector. And on the part of GMF, we are we are happy to contribute with our uh, with our limited own uh, measures. And uh, and my questions uh, to you, uh, you I I am aware that that most of your recommendations are based on the needs communicated via the survey uh, uh, by the participants, but you also mapped the available uh civic education realities and structures in the individual project countries and you mentioned among one of your recommendations and it, it resonated uh very much with me that we need more cooperation between the formal civic education and non-formal civic education and here my question would only be whether you could mention best practices among the the 20 uh 21 countries where you could identify structures, mechanisms, uh, processes, which do exactly this, which facilitate in a successful way, this cooperation between the formal education institutions and, and stakeholders, civic stakeholders of non-formal education. And the second point would be from my end, uh, I think, you really touched upon a hot potato uh, when when uh, you wrote that the perceived lack of seriousness of civic education is practically one of the large hindrances. And obviously it's true from a student perspective when the grading obviously could play an important role. 
But I think it's also true from a different perspective, and that's the perspective of politics and stakeholders. And, uh, and obviously, a crucial dimension is funding. If more public funding is available, then it signalizes that uh, civic education is taken seriously by politics. But my question is whether you were able to identify any other forms, patterns, mechanisms, which, uh, which strengthen this perceived seriousness of civic education at national level in policy frameworks with different tools than just funding. So the question in short is that, how can we change this perceived lack of seriousness of civic education from the policy perspective with non-budgetary tools? So these would be my initial questions. Uh, I see that meanwhile we received further ones. So please feel free to answer and then uh, we switch to the questions from our audience. I don't know. Uh, who starts? Do you want me to start and then you can, if you just feel free to, to chip in or to, to, um, uh, to interrupt me. So question number one, whether there are any good examples of cooperation between non-formal and informal um, civic education, um, formal and non-formal slash informal. I'm going to go back to the example of one of the local networks of civic education, and this is the Slovak one, which have been able to do exactly that, not only bundle the organizations um, in civil society that work on civic education, and they're in various, focusing on various target groups, um, et cetera, but also to build out of this a, an advocacy platform vis-a-vis -vis the Ministry of Education, the state. And this is a really great example because what they also do is they um, work data and evidence-based. So they do regular polls that look into specific questions and really try to figure out, is it important to start in preschool? What is the approach to that? Um, how exactly should we train teachers? So really looking in, into, into it into an ecosystemic, ecosystemic way. The second um, aspect to that question, or the second answer I would give to that question is that um, there are a lot of examples that are a one-to-one -one example. So you would have an organization working really well with 15 schools. You would have an organization that really works well with a network of teachers. And this again happens, um, this even happens in countries like Poland to where um, organizations usually cannot go to schools. What colleagues in Poland do is that they they do this on the local level. They work, you know, in Poland, there is still a level of decentralization, which is amazing exactly for that, in order to be able to enable that access. Um, so I think these are, um, you know, I think if we wanted to scale that, there is a lot for us to learn from uh, the Slovak network, there's a lot for us to learn maybe from the network also of the colleagues in Austria. These are the two, the only two that we could spot in the in the in the research. Maya, did you do you want to share a thought here as well? Or should I? I'll just take on the second one um, and please feel free to, to chip in. The lack of seriousness, um, especially among um among policymakers, why that. You know what? I think the best way to explain to policymakers why this is so important is to show them how and why civics and history textbooks have been amended in Poland and Hungary, but also in other places like Russia. And I think the moment you give this as an example, there is a really pretty quick way for one to understand why that is um, that is very important. Now. Is in democracy, civic education is not a propaganda tool. Um, this is just very important to highlight. And teaching democracy is not about making propaganda. It's really about enabling people um, to be able to judge, uh, to know what democratic principles are, and to, you know, to feel um, strong enough to uh, uh, contribute to their communities uh, for a better for a better life. And so I think one way to show um, why why and how this is important is really to give this to give that um, that as an example. And there is a lot 
that policymakers can do that goes beyond the finding. And this is really creating the in the institutional framework that gives organizations access um, to schools, to decision making, the drafting curricula, the drafting teacher training programs, because there are millions of euros that are spent um, from the ministries of education. Um, but apparently, and seeing from the need of trainings that uh, teachers take in the non-formal sector, apparently they're not good. Um, I think this is, um, they're not good enough. I'm not saying that there are not, no good teacher trainings, but apparently they're not good enough. At the same time, this is, I think, in the virtue of the thing. Civil society will always be a step ahead of an institution because it's more flexible, because it can um, innovate, it can pilot on a small scale. A ministry can hardly do that. So there is actually a positive argument to make and say, we can test this out on a smaller scale here and then can give it over to you, you can scale it, you can do whatever you want with it. So I think this is the this is the non-material um, uh, uh, to say the least. And there is a bunch of other things that can happen in the field of civic education as a subject when you begin teaching it, how long you teach it, how exactly you teach it. And I think this is in the recommendations we've put for the formal sector. Thank you so much. Maya, would you like to? Um, I can maybe take the, the question that is in the Q&A section that is on Malta um, and maybe just to explain a little bit further here the process. Um, we have had different sizes of the databases that we have received from local partners. And you can imagine Malta being an island, having a smaller um, smaller population than other countries that we have been mapping. We have then received a smaller database, which um, when I take you back to the slide on the response rate resulted in, a, in the fact that Malta is the country where we have the lowest response rate. And when you transfer that into percentages, um, this is something that Luisa and I have really struggled with quite a lot. And in the in the publication, we did not use uh, when we were describing Malta's responses in the national uh, national overview. We did not use percentages because saying 80 percent of civic educators in Malta was not correct, basically. Um, so that is why there is this maybe a misleading uh, part on the graph when it comes to Malta. Um, being mostly affected by the war in Ukraine. And maybe this is a, a good point that you have shared, and maybe we need to put an asterisk on the graph uh, for for further for further clarity. Thank you so much. And I think the first question was already answered by uh, by Luisa uh, through this best practice example of uh, of the Slovak case. And it's so good to see best practices also emerging in, in Central Europe and not just having a, a West East uh, knowledge transfer in, in that regard. And I think we should much more appreciate this, this Central and Eastern and Southeastern European best practices as well and, and learn from each, uh, from each other in a much more active way. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think there is still opportunity to ask further questions. Uh, I don't know, Luisa would like to uh, intervene. <laughs> I just wanted to add maybe um, a very, and I'm 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 not giving the example with Croatia because Maya is in the room, but it was very interesting, for example, to see how um, Croatia and Spain are very similar in the way um, civic education as as predominantly Catholic country sees civic education. So I think there is really much more to be said about the comparative context. And it's fascinating to see how some countries are so close to each other when it comes to the sensitivities to certain topics, um, despite the fact that they do not belong to a traditional European region. And I think to, the idea for us to do the mapping in this very um, non-linear way by starting with such a non um you know, unexpected combination of countries. We did not take all V4, we took three. We did not take the whole of the Western Balkans. We took a few. We did not take the whole of North Europe. Again, we took only a few. It was really because we ourselves wanted to challenge our own thinking because we're used to, you know, we're, we put together the V4 in one basket. 
we put uh, Western, Eastern, Southern, Northern. And so it's really a fascinating to compare um, and see, as I said, sometimes um, uh, similarities were to be seen where they were at least expected. Thank you so much. I think we still have time for another round. And if you allow me, I will just put three questions on, on the table. Feel free to put, put those ones with which you are the most comfortable and then we can continue uh, the discussion. Uh, one also relates practically to your to your statistics and, and it, their implications. And uh, when you have shown the age groups participating in the measures, uh, my question is whether this statistic was impacted by the fact that the, the respondents were both teachers from the public sector uh, and formal education, and non-formal educators from the civil sector. So there was a bias towards uh, the, the younger generation cohorts, or it was dominantly uh, civic and non-formal CSO background educators. And this is what, what we see in the case of their non-formal education projects, because having this 25%, and you also mentioned the cases of certain Scandinavian countries, and potentially you have different figures, but that was also my personal experience from Germany, that uh, the older age cohorts are much more actively participating on a voluntary basis in civic education. Uh, out of objective reasons, they have resources like time. For example, they are active citizens. And, and I think it's it's a best practice in these countries where we have this higher participation of older generations in the civic education, because we know that uh, in certain cases, older generational cohorts tend to, to elect illiberal or, or more conservative or, or more authoritarian politicians as well. And here my question would be whether whether you think that this model of civic education focusing on the older generation cohorts is transferable in any way to our region? Uh, if yes, why? If not, why? I would be really interested because I think this could be a civic education model with far-reaching uh, social and, and political implications. Uh, the second question relates to a phenomenon what you you mentioned, but I also wanted to provoke with this, and it is that you mentioned that civic education is is not propaganda. Uh, but what we see is that in an increasing number of education systems, civic education is is gradually, incrementally losing its democratic character, and it's turned to a sort of citizenship education, which very much focuses on national attitudes. And, uh, and history, so practically not the democratic participatory uh, content, but, but rather this, uh, uh, this subject relation uh, to the state. And, uh, and the question is whether you could identify any patterns or characteristics of education system, which tend to be more prone to this, uh, to this nationalistic or, or illiberal change and whether there are patterns and characteristics of education system which which appear to be more resilient uh, to to this term and uh, and yes I think that will be enough for our for our last uh, last round so please feel free to to address uh, what you think that it's the best one. Over to you. Maybe I'll start with addressing the, the first question on the process um, matter on the how we have approached uh, data collection in this part, and then I will give the word to Luisa for this harder part of the question. Uh, so when it comes to the to the age groups uh, and in general, we, we do acknowledge that, uh, of course, with the way that we have um, conducted the mapping and the way that we have gathered the database, there has to be a certain bias. Because, for example, if in a certain country we have a partner who has the great footing in historical civic education, then of course, even though we have advised the partners to try to look um, at the different uh, parts of civic education sector in their country, they do have most of the contacts in the sector that in the part of the civic education they are working on. Um, 
just for clarification, we did not include in the mapping teachers who work in uh, formal uh, civic education. So those are only educators working in non-formal and informal civic education. And from what um, we have gathered so far through our work, most of the civic education activities are geared towards younger people. And this kind of has just, uh, we have kind of just confirmed this through, through, our, uh, through our mapping. Um, so yes, now over to, to you, Luisa. Thank you, Maya. So um, your second question was whether the model that we see in countries like Germany to focus on generations or you know elderly 65 plus is transferable i think absolutely and i think this is um something that so to me the reason why the focus is on young folk people is really for pragmatic reasons or has been so far for pragmatic reasons easier to work with young people this traditional understanding that education is for the young I think we're only now in parts of Europe learning what lifelong learning really means for one, for one's career, for one's life, for one's um, life expectancy, uh, health, and, and and all of that. And so I think um, we're only now going to start to see how that um, how this shift happens. And there is a lot of work for people like like us, and by that I mean an inclu inclusive us, including you to really um, start to set this trend and uh, make sure that colleagues across Europe are really um, becoming sensitive about that. Because with aging populations, there is also no way but to really start engaging with, um, with elderly citizens. And there is so much potential because as you were saying, once you were also retired um, and if you're not troubled by ba bad health, um, you have a lot of time on your hands. Uh, and in parts of Europe, you also don't have so many means to travel, but you have, you know, your your biggest uh, kind of asset is your time and you could be spending your time in different ways. I think there is a lot of potential also when it comes to volunteering and and and, and all of that. So absolutely. Um, then um, your question related to um, civic education which is not, uh, you know, in countries that is not propaganda within the formal sector and countries where it's been um, instrumentalized. I think the, the, um, the temptation in a way, I think is there in a lot of countries in Europe. And this is why civic education as a formal sector has, in some of the countries, really become a battleground. Um, uh, we have spotted this in um, quite a few of the countries, and this is where usually the parties cannot agree on how exactly the subject should look like. And this is why they divert to this competence-based approach, where they don't have to agree on a subject, but there are competences where we all agree critical thinking is important. Left, right, we all agree. Analytical skills are important. Left, right, same thing. But we cannot agree whether um, the church is more important than uh, the prime minister's office. I mean, just giving a uh, you know a, 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 a stupid example just to make uh, to make the uh, to make the point. So the temptation is there, I think, to make it one way or another, and there are battles um, where I think. Mm, the moment a government starts um, diverting from the democratic principles, there are quite quickly tendencies to start introducing, not maybe immediately the subject, but um, subtle ways of teaching more patriotic uh, um, citizenship. Uh, I have seen it in my own home country. Um, I, we have seen it also in in other countries, um, as an example. And then, as I said, the the the, the extreme examples are um, in uh, parts of uh, Central Europe, where these subjects have become a sheer um, sheer propaganda uh, uh, subjects, if I can call it this way. So um, temptation is is there, and I think um, if we bring the question on a pan-European pan -European level. Um, I think it is high time, now that the European Union is also talking about reforms, 
to start thinking about the realm of education as seriously as we start thinking about defense and security. Because education has always been considered a matter of um, national priority and sovereignty. Same way we've been looking at defense and security and foreign policy. The world is changing. We need to make sure, not doing it in a propaganda way, but we need to make sure that European citizens understand what this um, you know, project is, is all about, understand who its friends and who its uh, foes are, have a clear uh, coordinate system within which it can, uh, you know, citizens can act and 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 prosper. Um, and I think it's high time for us to start thinking about uh, how does uh, civic education in Europe look like if we want to make sure that this uh, uh, union we've created uh, uh, post World War II is not uh, becoming even more fragmented. Thank you so much, Luisa, for this excellent closing words. We haven't been coordinating on uh, on this, but I can just yeah. echo your words. Uh, if you would like to uh, to live in more resilient democracies in the future, then it's high time to invest in the internal resilience of these democracies, and that exactly should happen through uh, investment in in civic and democratic education. Thank you so much for for your fascinating. Uh, fascinating contribution, the food for thoughts you uh, they provided us today, and and also for your dedication and, uh, and uh, your advocacy for the issue of civic education, both in the European continent and, and in our region, because I think that's, that's crucial from the perspective of our, the future of our democracies. Ladies and gentlemen, also many thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for your attention and we hope that we can welcome you in the future uh, in the next iteration of our, uh, of our webinars and online events as well. Have a lovely day and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, Daniel, for being such a great partner. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.